As God's child, one of your greatest privileges is the ministration of angels. That is, the availability of angels to both protect and support you when you need them to. Angels are God's special messengers. They are very powerful beings created by God in heaven to serve each of His purposes, both in heaven and on earth too. Angels are immortal beings, which means they never die. From when God created them, they don't age, but continue in the glory of God, worshiping the Father and fulfilling His desires. Satan was once an angel in God's kingdom, a very powerful one at that. However, he was cast out of heaven when he led a rebellion against God. He had successfully deceived other angels to see the way he wanted them to, and join his rebellion. Alas, they all lost their place in heaven and were cast out. Today, they roam about as demons under Satan's command, contending with God's prized possession, humans, and enslaving those they can. When you look at the scriptures from Genesis down to Revelation, the Bible records so much about angels that we can learn from to understand what they are and how they serve God's purpose in our lives. The Bible calls them ministers of God for those who will inherit salvation or eternal life. And who are those that will inherit eternal life? Believers all over the world. Hebrews 1, 14 Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Angels are spirits, and this means that they're not of this realm, although they can manifest here in whatever form that suits their assignment. My point is this. As long as you're a child of God, you're never alone. You have the Spirit of God living inside you, and you have the angels of God with you awaiting to serve God's plan in your life. This means that God commissioned them to you. Isn't that amazing that right now, as you're hearing the sound of my voice, there are angels commissioned to you? So when you walk on the street, someone is with you. When you're entering the vehicle or boarding that flight, there are angels with you. Everywhere you go, they're there with you. They never take the day or night off. The Bible tells us about one such plan in Psalms 91, 11 to 12. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. This is your inheritance, dear child of God. However, why does it seem like many times we are alone and there's no help coming from these angels, as if they aren't there at all? There are many factors that can contribute to this experience, and I will show you in a minute. One day, the Israelites received a threatening note from a foreign king. This king threatened Hezekiah, the then king of Israel, and blasphemed the name of the Lord God comparing him with the gods of the other nations he'd conquered. His words pierced them so much that the king took the letters and spread them out before the Lord inside the temple as he cried out to God to rise up and defend his name and his people. Well, long story short, that battle was not fought with swords and spears. The Bible tells us that at night, an angel of the Lord, just one, invaded the camp of the enemy's armies killing 185,000 men. If one angel could do this, what do you think two would do? What about five, ten, a legion, thousands? Know this for sure. You are adopted into God's royal family and therefore have come under the protection of His angels. So wherever you go, you've got divine security with you. When you sleep at night and the devil wants to come to oppress you, God's angels have been commissioned to stand guard over your house and over your family as well. Many people have been rescued from deadly accidents and life-threatening situations by strange miracles, which can only be attributed to the work of God's angels working on their behalf. For example, how does a strange person appear out of nowhere and tells you not to board a particular vehicle, even if it means you have to go late to your destination? You board the next one and realize that the said vehicle was involved in an accident and there were no survivors. How do you explain that? A coincidence? No, that was an angel. He came to serve that purpose for God for your safety. 
I remember the testimony of a young Christian sister who attended a particular church that was quite far from her residence. Because of the distance, it meant that she would be getting home late from evening services. She was always excited to attend meetings, so this wasn't a problem for her. Also, after being taught about the ministry of angels over God's children, just like we read in Psalms 91, she was confident that her angels were always on guard. One day, on her way back from church, late at night, she came across a group of street thugs standing by the roadside. It was quite late and there were no other people around. Well, she began to speak in tongues and pray under her breath, declaring her safety from the hands of these men, who may likely make a move on her. And just as expected, the moment they saw her, they stood up to charge at her. As she turned towards them, almost in shock, she noticed something strange. They all looked dazed, as if something else stunned them. They stared at her a few seconds and then sat back down slowly as if she wasn't there. She went back home, thanked God for preserving her, and went about her normal life. The following Sunday morning meetings, she shared this experience as a testimony of God's preservation from harm. She was sure that even if she couldn't explain what stopped them, she knew God has kept her from harm's way. Not long after she finished her testimony, a new face came up to share his testimony of salvation. She looked at this person because she had never seen him before, but was shocked when he stated that she's the reason he's standing there that day. He went on to narrate how this experience that same night brought him to Jesus. He had tried to find her in the community and followed her secretly to know what church she attended. What happened that night? Well, he said as they sat down there with his gang, smoking and getting drunk, waiting for any passerby they could rob or molest. Here she was coming. They planned what they were going to do to her once she came close enough. It seemed like a plan until she got to where they were gathered. He said the moment they stood up to pounce on her, as she turned to face them, they saw a giant standing behind her. He said this giant was walking step by step with her, and as she turned, he also turned, and his eyes were flames of fire. He said that was what dazed all of them so that none of them could move an inch for those few seconds. It was after this encounter he made the decision to go after whatever this lady was worshipping to have it in his life too. Dear Believer, just like this lady, do you know that God's angels are there to protect you? You haven't seen them at work in your life for some reason. First, you don't believe they're there. Whatever you believe, you position yourself to receive. You can't ask for something if you don't believe it exists, can you? Your belief in the existence, availability, and work of the angels of God for your benefit is a key point in activating their power in your life. You don't have to see them before you believe. Just believe because God's word says you have them. They are there. Do not shut them out of your life. Second, you're walking in disobedience and cannot activate them. Do you want to activate angel protection in your life? Walk in obedience to God's word. People who choose their own way go outside the borders of God's will for their lives. And angels don't obey such people nor operate outside God's will. An angel will not accompany you to a place where you want to go hurt or defraud others and sin. No. They respond and watch over those who fear and obey God. Psalms 34, 7 The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Thirdly, you're speaking contrary to God's word. The Bible tells us that they serve God's purpose, listening to the voice of his words. Psalms 103, 20 Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. God's angels are activated when we speak the language of faith in God's word. When you speak words of fear, doubt, or sin, they have nothing to work with. God's angels are quick to respond when we confess God's truth over our lives, often. When you say, the lines are falling for me in pleasant places, you're giving your angels orders from God's word to work things out for your good. How? Because when you say those words, they hear God's voice, not yours. Those are not your words, but God's words. 
Words are powerful. You command the power of the speaker when you say anything. So when you speak negative, you give power to negativity in your life, sponsored by the devil and his demons. But when you speak life, as stated in God's word over yourself, the angels are activated by the authority that backs everything God says, and they come out for your rescue. As you go about your business from here on out, believe that God's angels are with you. Commit to the three things I highlighted to you above. Believe that God has given His angels charge over you. Don't fear the threats or dangers surrounding you. Rather, believe and hang on to the divine truth. Angels are all around you because you are a child of God. Then, make sure to walk in obedience. As long as you're walking in agreement with God in faith, love, trust, and obedience, angels will rise up when you need them. The prophet Elijah had no reason to fear the army that surrounded him because he knew his ways were right and he was God's servant. Therefore, he knew that those with him were greater than those coming against him. When God opened the eyes of his servant, he saw that Elijah's location was surrounded by thousands of angels on chariots of fire. And lastly, speak God's word consistently over yourself. Don't catch yourself speaking contrary to what God says about you in His Word. Be assured of angel preservation this season. You will live, dwell safely, prosper, and never be stranded. In Jesus' name. If you have ever been in a fearful situation before, you will realize that something unusual comes over you. Your feelings and thoughts change at that moment. I bet that in your mind's eyes, your life flashed before you. However, one thing I noticed the most, which seems to be the trigger for the feeling of fear in that moment, is the flood of possibilities that overwhelms your mind in a strange way. In a moment, you could see all the possible ways a dog could bite you, how you could be injured, end up in the hospital, or even die. These thoughts will go on to trigger a fight or flight emotion, an ability within you. However, sometimes the thing we feared or pictured happening to us never happens. Yet, we may have come under intense and stressful mental and bodily torture that leaves us too weak to make any move after. Now, there are some things in this world to stay away from for your own safety. These things are naturally dangerous to you and you shouldn't engage with them. God gives us the ability to recognize such and the wisdom to keep away from them. Things like electricity, wild animals, engaging some sports without the necessary safety gears. None of these is safe for you, and you must therefore recognize their danger and stay away. But if you have the necessary protection, you have to reason to fear any of these things because you know you are safe. Having said all that, in this message today, I want you to know that none of your life's problems is bigger than God. You must, therefore, make sure that you do not fear whatever the devil or life may throw at you. Why? Because in the face of every mountain, you have a God with you who is so big that he calls the earth his footstool. I want you to say this after me. Say, God is bigger than my problems. Say it again. God is bigger than my problems. Then add, Therefore, I will not fear for anything or anyone. Take these words to heart, dear child of God. This message is coming to someone who needs it today, and I hope you are that person. This is a message from God to someone going through a season of life where he or she has or is about to throw in the towel because it seems the situation is beyond anyone's control, even God. You have prayed and prayed, fasted and fasted, but it seems the situation is refusing to bulge, like the mountain is refusing to move. This is God telling you, no matter what you face, do not fear. I am with you. I am bigger than your problems. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10 says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. If you are a believer, then I have good news for you. Unless it's over, it's not over with God. Yes, the situation has taken too long to go, 
Yes, the need is taking too long to end. The court case is looking impossible every day. Listen, until it's over, do not give up on God yet. He is bigger, greater, and wiser than your opposition. What is your biggest fear in this world? What is that challenge in your life right now which robs you of your peace at the slightest thought? I admit that fears are real. It is our first response to anything frightening or threatening our safety or well-being. This is the absolute truth. And every person born of a woman on earth experiences fear one way or another. You see, fear can be so effective that it has the power to influence how a person or group thinks and how they act. It will surprise you to know that someone can look high and mighty on the outside, but is afraid on the inside. Beyond all the boastings, bullying, take advantage of other people. There may exist a triggering fear, a fear of failing, ending up a failure, being called the weakling, not being good enough, being alone, living in the world unnoticed, and so on. Fear cripples. It paralyzes its host. It blinds our reasoning. It is a very unpleasant yet powerful emotion caused by anticipation or the awareness of danger or misfortune. When a person is under the influence of fear, whether the object of their fear is real or not, true or false, is not their concern. All they want to do is escape at that time, no matter the cost. Sadly, fear, no matter whom it operates on, is not of God. Fear does not come from God. And if it does not come from God, then we must know where it comes from. The enemy of our souls, the devil uses fear as a tool for enslaving and limiting whomever he can. But the child of God must know that whenever you feel fear taking over you, Satan is injecting you with his venom, and you must rise up and shake it off. Why? The answer is in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, and it says, For the Spirit of God gave us, does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Another translation says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. This is why you must not give room to fear, because it does not come from God and it does not belong to you. The Christian is not the dwelling place of fear. As you can see from the above scripture, that fear is a spirit, one that is definitely not from God. You, the believer, is the temple of God's spirit, a spirit of love, power, and a sound mind. The spirit within you is the spirit of God and he is above everything making you afraid. The spirit within you is bigger than the fears that have plagued you for so long, depriving you of your peace, joy, and progress. First John chapter four, verse four says, you dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. This is you right here. The Bible is not talking about anyone else but the child of God. If you are God's child, then this is for you. You house the Almighty within your spirit, and He is greater no matter what you face. If this is true, then why are you afraid because of one report, news, or current situation in your life? Rather than feed your fear, thereby causing it to keep growing, why not turn around and face your God who's bigger? and invite him into your situation. I once read a quote written by an astronaut in space a long time ago. It said, it suddenly struck me that that tiny pea, pretty and blue, was the Earth. I put up my thumb and shut one eye and my thumb blotted out the planet Earth. I didn't feel like a giant. I felt very, very small. From within the Earth, you and I consider it a very large object and in truth, it is. However, the further you go from Earth into space, the smaller the Earth begins to look. It was so small from that distance, the thumb of this astronaut covered any view of it. In the same way, whatever you bring closer to your view becomes more prominent. But if you push it further and further away, it soon becomes smaller and smaller until you don't see it again. God wants you to become more conscious of his presence and the greatness of his ability than you are of your problems. Enemy soldiers once surrounded the home of prophet Elisha. However, the man of God himself was not phased by it. On the other hand, his servant was paralyzed with fear and cried out to his master. 
Here's what Elisha replied to him in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 16 through 17. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. This is the perfect example of the words of the psalmists in Psalms chapter 34, verse seven. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. If you are a child of God, living according to the will of God and his word, dear saint, the ones with you are greater. He has vowed to give his angels charge over you to keep you from destruction. Yes, problems will arise, but you must never fear. Why? Because you have the greater one with you. Yes, weeping may tarry for the night, but you must not fear. Why? Because whatever has a beginning has an end, and the joy must come in the morning. Who would you rather trust to take care of your problem than the one who is greater than the mountains? Think for a moment that your problems are great mountains. Visualize those bills, that marriage crisis, the troublesome child, the bully, the nagging boss, the jealous colleague, or the difficult examination, which everyone calls impossible. See each one as a mountain as high as they can be. Now take a moment to notice how they affect your peace and emotions almost immediately. You see, that is what the devil wants. With each focus on your problems, you lose peace, joy, and motivation to even try. However, if you picture your God, the creator of heaven and earth with you, the one who clears mountains and seas with the breath of his nostrils, you can build faith and confidence here. Yes, the seas may rage, the disease may begin to get worse, but the bills may look like they are not moving. But do not be afraid. David was able to take down Goliath, not because he was greater or more skilled than the warrior, but because God whom he leaned on was bigger than Goliath. The three Hebrew boys were not bold before the king because they were immune to the flames. No, they were humans and could be killed. However, their convictions and consolation was in the God they served. They would rather trust in the God who is almighty than bow down to a God made with human hands. Yes, they were thrown into the fire, but the bigger God showed up and kept the fire from burning them. Sometimes the greatness of God may keep the problems from coming your way, but some other times his greatness permits the devil to do his worst. Why? Not because God hates you or wants to destroy you, but because he seeks to show the devil who is boss. He seeks to build your faith and strengthen your convictions in him when you see his power. Jesus was on the boat with the disciples, but that didn't stop the storms from rising. The disciples tried all they can, but failed. Then they invited the one who is bigger. And when Jesus rose, the sea became calm. God is bigger, my friend. Media, government, professionals, and analysts may magnify your problems or mountains, but don't fall for it. Keep your distance from every source of fear. Just like faith, fear also comes through information. Therefore, what you receive determines what grows inside you. If you keep listening to the information of your problems, you strengthen its grip on you, thereby increasing its size before your eyes. However, when you turn away from every negative report and choose to focus on God, faith begins to grow in you and the size of the problem becomes smaller. Someone said, don't tell God the size of your problems, rather tell your problems the size of your God. When you magnify God before your crisis, they lose their power over you. If you forget anything today, please do not forget this. Keep these words before your eyes and hold them dear to your heart. God, your heavenly Father, is bigger than your situations. Therefore, in the place of prayer, communication, praise, meditation on his word, confess the greatness of your God. Declare to your situation the faithfulness and might of your Father. He never fails. He will come through for you. Dust yourself up and tell the devil, no more. Break his grip over your life by turning to God. How? Through prayer and by standing on what his word says. When you hold God to his word, standing there in faith, he will respond. He may not respond on Saturday night or on Monday morning, but he will respond in the right time. God will show up. And when he shows up, 
Victory will become your experience. Rise up today like David and face your fears. Take that step you've been afraid to take before. Confront that situation head on. When you go in the name and conviction of the Lord Jesus, expect to see God's intervention. You shall return with a testimony. Hallelujah. Joel 2.25 I will give back what you lost. Once lost, it cannot be found. Many statements may come with a gloomy tone, finalizing the fact that anything lost cannot be regained. When lost, it is lost forever. This may be true of humans, but not of God. There is nothing God is interested in like restoring His children. He's the mastermind of restoration. You can call Him Jehovah the Restorer and Repairer. No chapter seems closed that He cannot reopen. There is no scattered life he cannot gather. There is no dying soul he cannot revamp. Nothing diminishing that he cannot replenish. He restores lost investments and resources eaten by the devourer. He restores lost opportunities and relationships. All these may be impossible for human beings, but with Almighty God, they are possible. He has restored the sick to health, regardless of the doctor's diagnosis and the medical reports. This includes the patient with what is termed incurable illness that defies medical efforts. The paralyzed are walking again briskly. The deranged minds are sane and sound again. The broken homes are reconciled. The dead are brought back to life. These manifestations and more are part of God's nature. They are natural to His personality. The scriptures validate these truths and are still relevant in our days till forever. It does not matter what you have lost or broken in your life. He can restore and repair you. He is sure of himself. He does not speak in vain. He cannot lie. No sound linguistics unit from him is empty or void. If he says it, he will do it. He is capable. Look at the above scripture. I will give you back. In other words, I will restore to you, not we will. The use of the singular pronoun shows capacity. God is saying to you, I am competent to do what I said because I am God all by myself. I will restore you. I do not need anybody's consultation to accomplish that. Even though his initial plan was for everyone to be in a state of wholeness without scratches. This could be said to be God's plan A. Here wants to see everything about man as perfect as desired by him. He does not want anything to tamper with us because we are special to Him, the creature He made in His image. We can perfectly capture this picture via the initial state of humans at the Garden of Eden, where God decked man with His glory of wholeness and dignity. The man was naked, but did not know because he had been enwrapped in glory. No sense of shortcoming or imperfection. He was in the state of nothing missing, nothing lacking, he had everything at his beck and call. All creatures naturally responded to his voice without struggle. This was his state before the author of sin, guilt, affliction, pain, and losses, the devil, tempted him. It seemed the devil knew the value of that divine positioning more than man, the beneficiary. That was why he did everything possible to seduce man out of that awesome state and man could not do everything doable to resist the devil from displacing him. It further appeared man did not value that privilege enough, because if he had, he would not have cheaply surrendered to seduction and given the devil access. This calls for deep consideration. Please, whatever position you find yourself by the privilege of God, be careful of the serpent and his seductions. He is still displacing people today. You shall never be displaced from your ordained position in Jesus' name. The man fell into that temptation and was chased out of the Garden of Eden. He was no longer worthy to stay there because he had been defiled. The devil was happy because he thought he had been able to erase man's race with that illicit achievement, that there would be nothing like a man being precious in the sight of God again. 
He thought man had lost it forever and cannot be loved nor cherished by God again. But God broke his back when he showed up himself as a merciful and gracious one who does not need anyone's consultation to bring man out of condemnation. He does not need Satan's opinion to justify and restore man. Satan stole the authority that did not belong to him in plan A and thought that was all. Nothing again. All hope was gone and lost for man. He never knew God had plan B. What a mighty God we serve. Could you please lift your voice and celebrate his mercifulness and loving kindness? Awesome God. This is saying to you, although he did not want you to lose, forfeit, miss, or mess up that thing, he is willing to restore you. It does not matter what the devil stole from you or damaged in your life. When he stole or damaged it, God can restore and repair it. Satan might have tempered with the plan A, but God has plan B. In his unfailing benevolence, God came up with plan B to rescue mankind. This plan was the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom the power to restore and repair lies. God sent him to ransom and redeem man, to restore to man what had long been stolen from him. Note that Satan is a robber. This action of God devastated Satan and rendered his boastfulness useless. He became helpless as a man was no longer at his mercy. The yoke of stealing was shattered, especially robbery without recovery. Whatever he steals will be recovered under this covenant in multiple folds. He will be made to pay more than what he ate because his legal hold on man has been broken. This new covenant was ratified by the blood shed on the cross of Calvary. By dying on the cross, Christ paid the price to restore in full. Satan the fool can never deny the proof that he died. Say to Satan right now, you can't deny the proof that Christ shed his blood for my restoration, be it spiritual, financial, health, physical, marital, etc. Under the provision of plan B, your restoration is just like breathing. It is an everlasting treaty that is beyond reversal or brokenness. It was sealed with the blood of the only begotten Son of God. What manner of love has the Father bestowed on us? Mankind was a lawful captive of Satan before Jesus Christ shed his blood to break this litigation and legality. Man was once separated and far from his Creator, but is now restored to him. Today, billions are born again, cleansed, redeemed, restored, and revived. This is possible under unexpected, unconquerable, and irreversible Plan B. Say, because of Christ, I am redeemed, restored, and repaired. Thank you, Father. Hey, God can restore no matter what it costs. What have you lost? What is that seemingly irrecoverable thing? God can restore regardless of its cost. If he could pay the greatest price by sacrificing Jesus Christ, his only son, to rescue and reclaim man's destiny, what would he not do to get you restored? If he could not withhold his son to replace the worst of the man with his best, he would not spare anything to secure your restoration. In actual fact, Automatically by redemption, you are restored. You just need to appropriate the provision of your situation. Take it, it's yours. Your dry bone is rising again. God has always been interested in the restoration of his children. The scriptures confirm this in the book of Ezekiel 37, where God took the prophet Ezekiel to the Valley of Dry Bones. The Valley of Dry Bones depicts the current situation of the children of Israel then. God needed to show the prophet this horrible and hopeless scene of the dry bones, so now he would know the degree of the Israelites' deplorable condition. Since the prophet had seen how horrible and impossible the situation looked, God asked him a striking question. Verse 3, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, Thou knowest. 
It was so despairing that he had to tell God, only you know if they can. Then God gave him the word of his authority to speak to the dry bones, and he did as commanded. Lo and behold, because God was involved in their situation, dry bones came back to life and live again. See verses 7 through 10. In the 11th verse, God made it known to them that he was ready to open their graves and bring them back to what they were meant to be. What was dead and buried about them was resurrected at the command of the Lord. God is also saying to you right now that your dry bones shall rise again. Dry bones in your spiritual life, career, destiny, business, finance, ministry, family, and among others, dry bones are rising again. God is bringing those things lost and long forgotten back. That which is important and relevant to the fulfillment of your destiny, Satan damaged, is being repaired right now. Beloved, all hope has not been lost. Remember the condition of the house of Israel. Just believe God. He is ready to suspend protocol to bring about your total recovery in Jesus' name. Our God is a protocol suspender. He can bypass natural laws and scientific procedures to achieve His aim. It does not take Him anything to do that. He has been an expert in that for ages. One among several empirical pieces of evidence can also be located in the book of 2 Kings 6. It happened that the sons of the prophet deemed it fit to expand their tent because the one they had was too constricted for them. Then they went to Jordan to cut wood for their construction. While felling a beam, the axe head of one among the sons of the prophet fell into the water, and he cried unto Elisha their master, who also followed them. He cried with distress because he borrowed the axe head and had no hope of recovering it. How would one recover an iron that does not float amid the thick Jordan River? On hearing this, the anointed of God, who believed in the power of God to suspend protocol, asked where the axe head fell, cut down a stick, and cast it on the spot, and instantly the iron swam. This is a manifestation of God's power to make the impossible possible. In the natural sense, iron can never float on water. But by supernatural intervention, the iron floated. What is this saying to you? God can sidestep procedures to bring about your restoration. It does not take man. It takes God. It does not take time. It takes faith. Whatever you have lost in the process of trying to advance, God who restored that axe head will restore you. Nothing is impossible with God. What are you looking for? The way out to locate it has come. All you need to do is to believe in the power of God to restore you through His Son, Jesus Christ. Admit your position and acknowledge His power. Reposition yourself in Him. He is willing to restore and repair you. His plan to bring you recovery can never fail. Believe His words, because He does nothing without His word. His words precede His performance. You need to sit and search His word, stay on the word, and insist on it. Have faith in the word you receive and speak it boldly over the situation. Remember God asked the prophet Ezekiel to prophesy according to His commandment. His words are His commandment. Never give the devil space in your life. He has lost his hold on you. Whatever he's doing around you is now illegal. He is a criminal. Arrest him. As a robber, his mission is to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus has come to reverse his agenda. John 10.10 10, I am Jesus Christ. Come that they, you and me, might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. It is a new dawn of divine restoration and replenishment in Jesus' name. There are three important seasons in every person's life. The seed or sowing season, the waiting season, and the harvest season. These seasons come in cycles, different aspects of your life. 
such that your life reflects your current stage. The waiting season is usually the most hated for many of us because it's the most challenging. During the waiting season, many things are tested. We are pushed. We get impatient, both with our seeds and with God, too. Sometimes you may even wonder why the harvest isn't coming. Dear friend, God has a word for you today. Stop doubting His timing. He's never late. Your harvest season will come soon. Your waiting season will soon be over. It may seem like if you don't get something fast, things are about to get out of hand. Hold on and stand your ground in your faith. Don't give up on God. His timing is always perfect. He's the creator of time. How can he miss it? The words seasons and time were first mentioned in the first chapter of the Bible. This in itself should give us an idea of how significant they are to God. Genesis 1.14 Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. You see, each season has its own purpose and its length. If you look again at the seasons of the earth where we live within the year, you'll find out that they influence how people live and do things. Seasons affect the climate, lifestyle, business, economy, and many other things around us. There are specific seasons to plant certain crops. When you miss this season, you have to wait until the next cycle to come before you can plant again. When you fail to plant at that time, you won't have anything to harvest during the harvest season. There are also seasons when certain businesses thrive. Why? Because certain commodities and services are more in demand during that time of year. These are indications that time and seasons control our lives. And the Bible tells us that God sent them to do just that. The reason I'm drawing your attention to this is simple. Would anyone draw such an order in his blueprints without a plan of action for each season? Now, I'm not talking about the earthly or physical seasons, but of the spiritual seasons, the seasons of our lives. Just as I pointed out at the beginning of this video, our lives are ultimately the results of the current seasons in the spirit and of what we're doing or not doing at that time. One day, God was speaking with the father of faith, Abraham, reassuring him of his commitment to him and all of that. Then Abraham went to open up to God about his fears. He told God how, although God said he'd bless him, he fears that even when the blessings come, there would be no child to inherit it. He didn't feel a child would be part of the blessing, and I can tell you why. He was bothered that God kept talking about blessing him, making him a generation, but never mentioning anything about his childlessness. Even though he trusted God, it felt like God was not interested in that aspect, and he just couldn't hold it in. He let it out and told God, You keep talking about how you're blessing me, but you haven't given me a child for all these blessings. When I die, my servant is the only one who would inherit my property. You see, God understood that Abraham was human, just the way he understands that you are human too. He didn't get mad at Abraham because he understood that Abraham was being honest about his feelings. Not that he was about to turn from God or insult him, but to share as a friend how much he needed that area of his life fixed. My friend, just like Abraham, God wants you to be honest about your feelings with him. I know that this can be abused, but still, the fact that people abuse something doesn't mean it no longer exists. Drugs are abused, but doesn't invalidate that people still get well when they use them you might need a fake and unprofessional medical person. This doesn't mean all doctors are going to be that way. So, I'm speaking to you. If even though you love God genuinely, you don't seem to understand why certain things are taking too long to happen. You've held your frustration too long and it's eating you from the inside out. Well, look at Father Abraham and learn from him. Talk to God about it in all honesty not in frustration or anger or even in resignation, but in faith, because you believe he can do something about it. This was the approach Abraham used, and I'll tell you why it was important. 
When you use faith to express your pains before God, you'll remain open for what He speaks or gives you as an answer. When you use anger, frustration, and resignation to express your concerns, you might not have the patience or sensitivity to hear anything God's going to say after that. You may end up storming out just as His response is coming. But hear what God told Abraham after he shared his concerns with him. Genesis 15, 4-7 Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. Just as I said earlier, because of Abraham's faith, he could receive God's response in his prayers. If he'd have prayed in doubt or negative frustrations, he would have been hasty, just complaining and storming out. And that attitude never produces anything good from it. Let us learn from Abraham, dear friend. God was already aware of what Abraham needed in order for the things he promised him to happen. For example, he couldn't be the father of many nations if he died without a child. He couldn't have a generation if his name died with him. And so God had a plan and a time for everything he told Abraham. Of course, Abraham hadn't learned it at this time, so he was worried. But after God spoke to him, his faith was empowered, and he would go on to believe God to the last minute. Romans 4, 18-22 tells us, Against all hope, Abraham and hope believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, So shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. Being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised, this is why it was credited to him as righteousness. Sarah, on the other hand, was not having any of these dealings, and so she began to get frustrated and impatient about the fact that she was getting too old to have a baby. This frustration would lead to the birth of Ishmael by the servant girl, Hagar, and rock the peace of the family for some time. The child Ishmael is the product or example of impatience with God. When you begin to doubt God's timing, you begin to lose patience with Him. Dear friend, don't miss this message if you're in your waiting season. What are you waiting for? If God promised you, believe Him, it will come. Just like seasons never fail, your season will finally come. You have sown your seeds, and now you're waiting, and it seems harvest will never come. Sometimes it gives you a sign like it's about to come, and then it disappears again. Fear not, your time will come. Sometimes you may see people in their harvest seasons and begin to think your own season has passed. Don't panic. Don't doubt. Everyone has their own season. You don't have the same destiny. You are different. Just like winter, your season will come. Remind yourself of the God you've believed. He has a track record of keeping His word. He never fails, never has, and never will. Someone once said, God does not only speak because He wants to inform you. He speaks because He wants to perform what He's talking about. This statement confirms what God Himself said in Isaiah 55, 10-11. As the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Has God said something to you lately, or for some time now? Don't doubt it. He told you so you could have something to hold on to, not so you could do it. It's not in your power to work it, but in His. 
You have one job and that's to cooperate with him. Stay on your toes. Be on the lookout for when he sends you signs. Be ready to move when he says to move. And be ready to stand when he says to stand. That's your job, just like Abraham. I encourage you to study the life of Father Abraham. See how he made sure he kept his eyes and ears peeled all the time. He was always on for when God would say something to him. He knew that God has no limit in performing. We're the ones with the limit in experiencing. Therefore, through faith, he was always on to pick God's instructions. And at the right time, his miracle came. He held the child of promise, Isaac. I pray for you. May you receive renewed strength to believe God all the way to the end. May your newfound faith replace every doubt and fear. And may it trigger active engagement in prayers and praises as you wait to hold your own miracles too. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. A mess of a life is a life that has the visible remedy to the disaster that it has come into. It is an invisible state of deterioration, so bad that it looks impossible to salvage anything worthwhile out of it. It is such a bad occurrence that you cannot see a time when you are back to winning ways. Pleasant living conditions, a healthy relationship, a break into freedom, or whatever you once enjoyed before the mess came into your life. The future looks so bleak, so dark, so uneventful, and so negative that it loses all color. You are probably thinking to yourself that you are done for, that you have definitely met your doom, that the danger that has stalked your success story all the while has finally caught up to you. This is a phase of life of such a low rating that almost no one speaks of it. No one is proud of the low ebbs of their lives. No one is proud of the dark seasons of their lives. Nobody likes to remember or talk so much about them. We all lock up such stories of despair in hidden pits of our memories, almost never visiting them again. History has it in the record of such great and prominent names who encountered heartache at its worst and most perilous places that they were almost wiped off completely by the turn of events in time. This is a sad but true reality. Sadly, what we see on the pages of biographies and magazines are the annals of amazing feats achieved by such great men. The wealth, the splendor, the privilege, and properties amassed by them all through their lives. Their connections to relevant and highly placed political allies and international powerhouses that aided their meteoric rise into fame and stardom. When we consider instead the dark clouds that surround their lives, also the clouds of pain, the clouds of frustration, the clouds of loss, the clouds of deep poverty, the clouds of rejection, the clouds of loneliness, the clouds of betrayal, the clouds of attacks among so many other clouds. The truth we refuse to dwell upon is that all who have arisen have encountered more lows than highs in the brief yet lengthy season of life they have lived. They have known the bitter taste of pain and suffering and have drunk of this cup so many times. The successes we measure then are minute uphill moments of bliss that made their lives seem like a fairy tale. Complaints abound in the world today about the life and living conditions of so many. People gripe and complain about the hand they've been dealt in life and how it is impossible for them to make any sense of such a life. They feel wronged, cheated, heartbroken, and relegated to obscurity. Sadly, God is the most intentional when it comes to making historical events with the dark seasons of men's life. He does know the devil, yet he plans for all possible twists and turns in the loop. He is aware of the wickedness of the enemy and the seemingly heavy odds against you. Jesus knows. He did not leave you alone against it, all on your own. No, he did not. He is very deliberate about you. 
he is aware of what your upper and lower threshold for handling issues are. He knows your limits. He knows it like the palm of his own hand. He is aware of your tendencies and potential. He knows, God knows. I know you feel you are at your wit's end right now. I know you have stopped believing in yourself on some grounds. I know no one who matters to you or once did trusts you anymore because of that scandal, that misstep, that mistake you were involved in. I know it was unforgivable what you did. I mean, by human standards, they would have pelted you with accusations, suits, and all manner of disgraceful filth. Thankfully, God has not left you to men and their plots. He is intentional about the trajectory of your life. You are his child, dear one. He knows your pain and your hurt. He knows the sad stories that surround your life. And he is aware of the unfavorable conditions that seed you on all sides. He knows. Jesus knows all about your struggles. I am here to tell you that there is hope for you. There is a place of absolute peace beyond all the stigma and abuse. There is a place of security away from insults and the critical gaze of enemies and those who doubt or suspect you. This place is secured in the plan of God for you, that no matter how perilous the times we are in gets, he has a known end for your life. He is deliberate about how your life will go. He is fully conscious of taking advantage of the flawed view of the enemy on your behalf. He plans to trap the devil into paying for your fame without a dime of your efforts spent by giving you free publicity and suddenly changing the narrative so powerfully in your favor that the whole world would bear witness to how glorious God's move is in your life. Where you would have only been celebrated on a local platform, he allowed the enemy to put you in difficult straits with a plot to disgrace and insult you on a much broader platform nationally and internationally. God then comes around the issue and uses that instead to your advantage. Not now as the widely popular failure and a fool, but as the renowned royalty who rose up from the pit to the highest plains based upended plot of the devil. You are not a motivation to those who surround your life and see you from a great distance until your misery becomes a well-told success story. They cannot relate to one who is already up there as deeply as they would relate to you. You who failed and languished in sadness right before them, nothing strikes home like the success story of a life you were privileged to know closely at the seasons of their worst low. They saw you when you failed, when you cried, when you were hurting, when all hope seemed to have been lost, when you needed hand-me-down clothing, when people had to help you with food and resources to survive, when you struggled with doing the job right, when you had to work three jobs just to barely get by in life. They saw you when your family was heated, inconsistent seasons of arguments and disagreement, they saw you when you had no help whatsoever as you chased your dreams daily and failed at it regularly. They were present for it all. Because of this singular fact, they are more than aware of the impact that God has had in your life when things finally turn up for you and begin to go your way. People can relate a whole lot more closely and emotionally to a story they had witnessed firsthand. They know more than anyone out there about your pains and struggles. They are more aware that you were a serial failure with nothing to show for your efforts but pity and a sorry look. Such miraculous turnaround situations are so symbolic that they provoke such radical faith in the heart of so many people around the life of the one whose story has been changed forever. In the Word of God are similar accounts of these unique encounters that God gave such weak and broken men through the ministry of Jesus that sparked so much faith that it pushed the spread of God's Word on a whole new level. This is the tale of a witness 
A witness is a proof that you actually went from the lowest ebbs to this great height we see today. The story bears much fruit from the mouth of a witness as observed by another who watched you as you grew and was finally helped by God. Luke chapter 4, 21 through 22. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears, and all bare him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? Your disadvantage, the problem that is making you disgraced in public today, the issue that has become a point of mockery for you, these situations around your life that have raised you up on high platform to be insulted and dragged into the mud by a larger audience who can see into your life is a setup by God. God plans to use the tactics of the enemy, which were originally meant for hurt and disaster for you, to become the unique place of announcement for you despite it all. The devil doesn't know this, and so he forges ahead to disgrace. Insult and destroy your image through these events. This is not the first time God has made the devil look like a fool concerning the lives of so many patriarch before you. He did this with Jesus too. These are the precious scriptures you must hear from. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 8 through 10. Which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. The devil miscalculated. He did not know that his plans and schemes were being used by the all-wise God for the glorification of his Son. You are God's precious son and daughter. He has this exact plan for you too. Jesus was disgraced, broken, beaten, insulted, treated like a thief, abused, condemned, died the death of a notorious criminal, alienated, and grieved to death. Yet it was all a plot to prepare such glory for him that could not be contested for. Jesus alive could not save all men. Jesus alive and moving from town to town could not help and heal all men. But he who was publicly disgraced and even killed was presented on such a high platform in order to embarrass God, but was instead used to further God's plan here on earth. God used this scenario to create wonder both on earth and in heaven too. God turned his life into such a powerful message that has remained a deeply relevant voice for so many centuries since. His story is still speaking even right now, in our world, and will speak forever. So stop struggling, control with God, and let him have his full way with your life. Let him be ahead of you and lead you despite this season of your life. Humbly allow the Lord to take you through all the routes he would have you follow, that he may make of rather mundane life a voice, a message that speaks forever. <laughs>